Okay, so today I want to talk about the weight training myth uh, that people still believe. And there are probably plenty of videos about this topic. You can just search them on YouTube or Google. But I want to address the ones that annoy me the most and the ones that aren't addressed as much. So, the first one, somatotypes. Now, somatotypes, um, people believe that there is an uh, ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph. And ectomorph is believed someone who's naturally very thin, has trouble gaining weight. Endomorph is the opposite, who's naturally more fat, has trouble losing weight. And a mesomorph is kind of like the best of both worlds, right? Someone who has easier time getting muscle, but doesn't get as much fat. Um, the problem is that anyone can get skinny, anyone can get fat, and anyone can gain muscle. It has nothing to do with these somatotypes. Being thin is just a matter of under-eating, and being fat is just a matter of overeating. So there is no such thing as these somatotypes. Now, there are obviously some genetic factors, such as your height, uh, bone structure, limb length, um, different muscle fiber distribution, all of these things can affect your overall genetics. And these are a lot of times used as an excuse, like um, you know, ectomorph use usually their ectomorph status as an excuse why they can, can gain weight. But the truth is they, they just don't eat, eat enough. Um, and I actually was guilty of this myself. You know, I used to believe that I am this ectomorph. And the truth is that, uh, first of all, I was very active. I used to compete in tennis. And on top of that, I simply wasn't eating enough. And a lot of these ectomorphs, they, they believe that they eat enough. But uh, they simply just don't. And a lot, lot of times they they actually do intermittent fasting without even realizing. Uh, like, they can go for hours without eating, um, they forget to eat, and then they have this large meal, and because of, they have this one large meal, they believe that um, they eat a lot, and also people around them believe that they eat a lot, but overall, they don't really eat it much throughout the whole day. And again, endomorphs are the opposite. They have they have naturally high appetite, and they they think they don't eat as much, but they actually do. And eating a lot or not eating as much is a relative term. You know, eating a lot for someone is um, a nothing, and for someone else, it's like a huge amount of food. So that's a very relative term. But anyway, gaining weight or losing weight is all about uh, calorie surplus or calorie deficit. So. Again, it has nothing to do with these somatotypes, and sometimes they are used to market certain um, programs or diets. And then we have the mesomorph, and I don't think anyone even ever believed that they're mesomorph. Usually they believe they're ectomorphs or endomorphs, which often is used as an excuse for not getting their results. But usually a thin person is labeled as ectomorph, fat person is labeled as endomorph, relatively muscular person is labeled as mesomorph, and there are even some ridiculous examples of like someone who's for example skinny fat, they are labeled as um, ecto slash endomorph, which, which is just ridiculous. So again, there's no such thing as um, ecto endo endomorphs, um, genetics do matter obviously, but again, gaining muscle is mostly about um, progressive overload, losing weight is about calorie deficit, and gaining weight is about calorie surplus. It's that simple. Also, if you put, um, let's say you take 130 pound ectomorph, and then you take uh, 225 pound um, endomorph, and you have them spend all day together, like, that, like they eat together, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you that the 130 pound ectomorph is going to struggle to keep up with the endomorph and vice versa if endomorph eaten as much as the ectomorph he would probably be feeling like he's starving so again being thin or being fat is all about you know, calorie surplus or calorie deficit again it's that simple and there are no things like uh, somatotypes they are usually used as an excuse or to market certain 
programs or die. So stop worrying about these other types, forget them, and let's move on. Okay, the next one is um, size doesn't equal strength. And people constantly bring this up. And the most common argument they use is, oh, they know this one guy who is insanely strong for his size, and therefore size doesn't equal strength. And this is what irritated me the most, like people constantly bring this argument. When they use, uh, uh, they basically use exception to the rule instead of the norm. Because, you know, there is this one record holder who uh, lifts this insane amount of weights for his size. And, <laughs> and that's their argument that size doesn't equal strength. Um, they should use example majority of people rather than just one, um, one exception. And the thing is that this is obviously also genetics. So for example, let's say you have uh, two people and one is bigger, but the other one is stronger for his size. Um, now, the one thing is obviously um, performance enhancing drugs. Uh, this can um, change the ratio between size and strength. But if we assume that they're naturals, and let's say one is still stronger for his size, uh, this is mostly just genetics. Obviously, there are things like um, your height, your limb length, um, which, can, which can all affect leverages, then uh, different muscle fiber distribution, which is again genetics. So usually if you have one guy who's strong for his size and other who is bigger, who isn't as strong for his size, this is mostly just genetics. It's not because this one guy trained for strength and the other guy trained for size. Um, again, it's either of genetics, drugs, or um, individual leverages. So, um, but if you take one person, the more muscular version of the exactly same person is always going to be stronger than less muscular version of this same person. So yeah, there are some uh, genetic freaks who are insanely strong for their size, but even them, like, they are, they probably carry more muscle than when they were lifting 200 pounds less. So you have to look at person as an individual. So yes, you can have two people who have different uh, size to strength ratios, but it's usually, usually mostly just genetics. But the more muscular version of the exactly same person is always going to be stronger. Okay, so the next one is that one to five reps are for strength and eight to 12 are for hypertrophy. And this is almost a follow-up to the previous myth. Um, you can gain size and strength from almost any rep range. Now, obviously we don't want to, want to go to complete extreme. So like, uh, like doing 50 rep sets or something like that. But generally, um, Again, you need to apply progressive overload and whenever you apply progressive overload, you are going to get stronger and you are going to gain muscle regardless of what rep range you're using. Now, obviously low reps do have better carryover to one or max, but that's simply specificity of training. But if you apply progressive overload, um, you are going to gain, gain size and strength. So for example, let's say somebody does so three sets of 10 with 100 and, you know, whatever units you're using. So, and he eventually get to a point where he can do three sets of 10 with 110. Well, he, he's stronger now. He's one rep max, five rep max, 10 rep max, 20 rep max. All of these are probably higher now. Now, again, his one rep max probably wouldn't be as good as if he trained with low reps, but he's still stronger. So you can gain strength even from high reps as long as you progress. And by the same token, you gain hypertrophy even from low reps if you progress. Now, obviously you need a sufficient amount of volume, but remember that volume is uh, reps times sets times weight. So if you do more sets, even with low reps, you can still do a lot of volume. So, and there's actually, there's been a study um, you know, Brad Schoenfeld did it. So, you know, one group did uh, three sets of 10 
other group did 7 set of 3, and both of these groups gain similar um, amount of hypertrophy. So again, there is no magical rep range for, uh, for gaining muscle. Now, it's usually more about the intensity you train with, so usually when you want to prioritize hypertrophy, <clears throat> it's probably best to train somewhere between 70 to 80% intensity, because it allows for sufficient amount of volume, but at the same time, just enough mechanical tension. So, but again, even within these uh, intensities, you can apply um, any rep wrench as long as you can handle it. So, uh, again, mostly, and I know it sounds like a cliche, but it really is about that progression. So, as long as you're progressing, regardless of rep wrench, you are gaining size and strength, period. Now, the last one that I'm going to address is the myth that when people say that uh, you should perform exercises slowly. Now, um, your muscles are actually not meant to be slow. When you want to prioritize, you know, size and strength, you are you want to use mostly fast twitch muscle fibers. You use fast twitch muscle fibers when you use more force or when you um, use more speed. Well, basically, when you use more speed, you also use more force. So. Bigger muscle can always use more force. And when you try to use the most amount of force, um, you're using mostly fast twitch muscle fibers. And you use mostly fast twitch muscle fibers when you either lifting very heavy weights, or when you're getting close to failure, or when you uh, do them as explosively as possible. Now, doing them explosively doesn't mean um, that you use bad form it means you actually contract the muscle as fast as possible. So again, doesn't mean you use momentum, doesn't mean you use bad form, it means you contract the muscle as fast as possible. Now obviously, uh, in some cases, it's better to do them slowly. It's mostly when people are just learning the movement, the technique. So for beginners, for example, because when they do it fast, uh, they are more likely to lose form. But once you can maintain a good form, you should always do them as explosively as possible, especially the concentric part of the uh, movement. Now, even the eccentric, now, eccentric, it should be controlled, meaning you don't ha uh, you don't let it fall with a free fall speed. So it, the eccentric should be controlled, but it also doesn't mean you have to do it super slow. Now, I would suggest you do a speed that feels natural for most people, so not too fast, not too slow. So uh, it should be controlled, but the concentric should always be as explosive as possible, as long as you can maintain form, obviously. Now for some movements, maybe some rehabilitation movements or maybe some isolation movements, it's probably better to do them slowly simply because you are more, more likely to lose form or start cheating. But for the main compound lifts, uh, the concentric portion should always be as explosive as possible. Now, a good example would be if you took uh, an untrained person and you have him perform sprints, his legs are probably going to hypertrophy a little bit. Now, if you would be just walking, his legs wouldn't grow that much. Now, obviously, if you took a trained person who already squats, he probably won't gain much leg size from sprinting, but um, someone who isn't that well trained he's going to gain a little bit of hypertrophy on his legs from sprinting because he's sprinting as fast as possible and he is using fast twitch muscle fibers and he's stimulating some growth. Whereas if you would be just walking, which is um, similar movement that is done slowly, um, that it wouldn't stimulate as much. Now, another thing people point out that they should be performed slowly is uh, time under tension. And um, time under tension is sometimes simply just using more volume. So for example, let's say um, if you do an exercise explosively, you can do eight reps, right? Now, if you did every rep slowly, you might do only five reps with a weight that you would otherwise do, would be able to perform eight reps. So while you are like 
increasing time under tension, well, you're actually really not because you end up doing less reps. And you have to keep in mind that once you start getting close to failure or when you lift heavy weight, the reps are going to slow down anyway. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say about some of the myths that I don't really address as much. Anyway, make sure to comment, like, subscribe. And I know I'm still a little awkward in front of camera. Again, as I said, uh, English isn't my first language and I'm simply not used to speaking in front of camera. But as I will do it more and more, it will hopefully improve by time. So I'm still new at this, but again, everyone starts somewhere. So I'll see you next time.